Thank you. Hey, thanks very much for inviting me here at MIT. I, I got my PhD here in the Green Building uh, 40 years ago. It's nice to, nice to come back to MIT. This is our beautiful planet, but after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with smoke <laughs> covering the world from the fires that would be started that, that Ira just described. And this, of course, would absorb sunlight, block out the sun, making it cold and dark at the Earth's surface. And the temperatures could get so cold that it would be like winter time in the summer. And this, of course, would kill basically all the crops, and the people that didn't die from Ira's scenario would die of starvation. This is, and this is what's called nuclear winter. Now, in, this is a graph of the total number of nuclear weapons on the planet. It, it, the total includes the other seven countries, but the US and Russia have most of them. And you can see in the 1980s, the nuclear arms race ended. Why? Uh, and Jonathan said it was because of demonstrations in Central Park. That was part of it. But part of it was because scientists informed policy. Crutzen and Burks, uh, Paul Crutzen got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on stratospheric ozone, but he also wrote a paper pointing out that there would be smoke from nuclear war and that it might cause climate change. And the next year, both Russian and American scientists calculated the climate response. <clears throat> Their results agreed, showing that their temperatures would get very cold. The next year, I published a paper <coughs> in, in Nature and, and Covey et al. did, and then the nuclear arms race ended. And that was, uh, now, <laughs> one of the theories is that it was the end of the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union didn't end until five years later, long after the nuclear arms race had ended. Now, we scientists do our research by running models, looking at data, but historians do research in quite a different way. They ask the people that made the decision. So here's some evidence to support my claim. Uh, well, first of all, the, the number is not zero by next year because of the treaty, so the problem still exists. So Ronald Reagan uh, said a great thing, reputable scientists are telling us that such a war could just end in no victory for anyone because we would wipe out the earth as we know it. If you think back to natural calamities in the 1800s, volcanoes, we saw that weather so changed there was snow in July in many temperate countries. They call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, one volcano can do that. What are we talking about with the whole nuclear weapon exchange and nuclear winter? And Mikhail Gorbachev, the other person that made the decision, models made by Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. That was a great stimulus to us. So that was part of this story. The problem is that it's not solved yet, and so we still need scientists to inform policy. Here's a graph of the number of nuclear weapons, number of countries with nuclear weapons as a function of time. It was growing about one every five years. The Soviet Union uh, disappeared, and three countries, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, got them. They gave them back to Russia, but then Pakistan and North Korea. So there are many other countries now besides the US and Russia that have nuclear weapons. Uh, here's one inventory, 16,400. And if you break it up, the U.S. and Russia each have seven or 8,000. As we saw on the graph previously, the other countries have a couple hundred. What happens when you drop a nuclear bomb? Well, I'm not going to show you bodies like I already did. I just want to. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, it's like bringing a piece of the sun to the earth for a fraction of a second. And it starts fires. This is a drawing done by one of the survivors in Hiroshima. What they remember is the fires and the smoke. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. All the, the, the city was up in smoke. Now, here's a cartoon uh, looking at what, what it would happen after a nuclear war started in the, in the Sinai. So this nuclear winter was done in the 1980s. About 10 years ago, Brian Tune and Rich Turco met me at the American Geophysical Union meeting and said, somebody asked us what would happen if two of these new countries, India and Pakistan, had a nuclear war. What would happen? They each have about 100 weapons each, and they're probably very small weapons, like the Hiroshima weapons, 15 kilotons, not the big ones that, that exist now in the modern arsenals. And Brian said, I said, probably not much. But then he went and calculated how much smoke there would be. And 5 million tons of smoke. And I said, well, that's a lot. Who's going to calculate the climate response? He said, well, maybe we thought you would. So <laughs> imagine, imagine the scenario along the Kashmiri border. There's a skirmish. 
uh, and because of poor communication or misunderstanding or panic and fear, it grew into a, a nuclear war. People get killed all along that border every, every week. Or imagine what a lot of Americans are proud of is us killing Osama bin Laden. If you were Pakistani air defense and you saw these uh, military invasion, who would you think would be invading? Do we risk a nuclear war by doing that? So the scenario we have is what if 115 kiloton uh, weapons were, were used? This is much less than 1% of the current nuclear arsenal. The direct effects would be horrible, as Ira just described, but it would produce about uh, 5 million tons of smoke in the upper troposphere. So we put that into a climate model, and here's a graph showing where it would go horizontally and where it would go vertically. This is the tropopause, so it would go up into the upper stratosphere and stay for uh, a number of years. We did this with a modern climate model for the first time. We, it, the smoke would last much longer than we thought before. It would spread around the world and it would block out the sun. So we calculated how the temperature would change. And here's a graph of global warming that I spent a lot of time working on. And uh, it, it would have a rapid uh, cooling and it wouldn't be winter temperatures, but it would be one, one and a half, two degrees Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit below normal. And this would be climate change, unprecedented in recorded human history. It would be colder than the Little Ice Age. That was one climate model, the NASA GIST climate model. People say, well, you know, we don't trust models or this. Uh, so we, we, uh, every model has its imperfections. So recently, uh, two other climate models have done the same experiment, uh, one in Switzerland and one at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and all three find the same result. From only 115 kiloton bombs, much less than 1% of global nuclear arsenal. Now, Mike Mills did a, a nicer graphic that I like. This is uh, looking from the North Pole to the South Pole, where the smoke would go, and it would rapidly go into the, the troposphere is where we live, where there's rain that washes out particles. But if you get it up in the stratosphere, there's no rain, and it can, these small particles fall very slowly, but they're heated by the sun and lofted. So you can see this has now gotten to uh, July, so in the northern hemisphere, it's, it's heated by the sun, lofted up here, and then it will go up there, and it will stay for more than a decade. So this was something that was only discovered by redoing these calculations with a modern climate model. So then we plotted how the temperature and precipitation would change from these three different climate models. And so this is the temperature over 10 years would go uh, uh, one, to two, uh, one to two degrees below normal, precipitation would go about 10% less. And uh, also this smoke, of course, absorbs sunlight and heats the upper atmosphere. And it gets very hot in the stratosphere and this destroys ozone. And so you have a lot more ultraviolet radiation reaching the surface. In spite of the smoke, more ultraviolet would reach the surface. And we worry about the ozone hole in Antarctica in the spring, but it would be like a nuclear winter ozone hole. The whole world would have a reduction of ozone with more ultraviolet. The most important consequence of this or any other climate change is how it affects our food. So we took these scenarios, we put them into crop models to see how it would affect and we looked at the two countries that produce the most food, the United States and China, how it, how it would affect corn and soybeans in the U.S., rice, maize, and wheat in China. And here's a graph showing for 10 years uh, the reduction of 10, 20 percent, 20 percent, 40 percent of these different crops uh, forced by the results of these different models. And to summarize, for the first five years, food production in the world would go down by 20 to 40 percent. You know what happens when the price of food goes up a little bit. There was a drought in Russia five years ago, and the price of wheat, uh, they stopped exporting wheat, and that produced the Arab Spring there, where the, the price of food went up. And the price of food produces revolutions uh, many times. Uh, so that's not correct. <laughs> not according to the, uh, so, uh so you can imagine, uh, people like us, rich people like us, the price of food would go up a little bit, a bit. The people that are living on the margin might uh, uh, be subject to famine. I was estimated one to two billion people would die from, from, from famine. But it's much worse than that. This is the US Trident nuclear submarine. It has 96 nuclear weapons, much bigger than the ones I just talked about. So each Trident is 1,000 Hiroshima's. And the U.S. has 14 of them. 
and that's half of our nuclear arsenal. And Russia has the same size arsenal. So we said, there were questions about whether nuclear winter theory was correct. So we said, let's go back and do the, the, the a war between the US and Russia. So we used the NASA model, and we put 50 or 150 million tons of smoke. What could produce 150 million tons? The current arsenal could if you put one bomb on each target. In the past, we, there were so many bombs, you, you, they were all used up before, uh, before uh, uh, they ran out of the, the arsenal. So this, this is a graph showing the smoke from this scenario. And this is the uh, climate change. I had to rescale the graph. So temperatures would plummet uh, below the ice age temperatures. Now, before you ask, everybody ask this question. Yes, this would solve the global warming problem. <laughs> I mean, you've done a calculation of that. The idea of blocking out the sun is called geoengineering, and it's also a bad idea, not as bad as this idea. But uh... So what's new? A nuclear war between any nuclear states using much less than 1% of the current arsenal, doesn't have to be India or Pakistan, would produce climate change unprecedented in human history. Such a small nuclear war could reduce food by 20 to 40% for a decade, more ultraviolet radiation. Nuclear winter theory was correct. The current nuclear arsenal can still produce nuclear winter, and the effects will last for more than a decade. Do you believe me? Yeah. yeah. Good. But that's only a model calculation. Scientists like to check models, check theory with observations. And of course, we can't do this experiment in the real world. So we use analogs. We use things that have happened that inform us about parts of the theory. I'll just mention a couple of them. Volcanic eruptions. This is a beautiful painting of the volcanic sunset after Krakatau over the Oslo Harbor uh, that, that, uh, that Monk uh, remembered and, and did. He said the sky was screaming blood and fire. Mm. This is the uh, Tambora volcano, which erupted 20, 201 years ago, producing the year without a summer. Uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Lord Byron, uh, Mary Shelley were having their vacations on the shores of Lake Geneva. And it was really cold and gloomy that summer, so they had a contest to see who could write the scariest story. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, inspired by the climate change. Byron wrote a poem called Darkness. I had a dream it was not all and it, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars then wandered darkly in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and Solution is to, is to ban nuclear weapons now. Yeah. And so, as Ira said, the open ended working group now is working to, uh, after these three international conferences. I wrote an op ed that in the New York Times last month to try and warn people about it. Uh, but unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thanks. <laughs>